Hello and welcome to Animal Sciences 263. Today's lecture is going to be on some techniques used in fish and fisheries research. Now before we go any further we should talk about the difference between fish and fishes because at this point you've heard me use both terms. Well as you heard in grade school the word fish can be used for a single individual or multiple individuals. So at the left we have one fish, in the middle we have two fish, and at the right we have many fish. On the other hand, if those fish involve more than one species, we use the term fishes. So if we look at the photo below, you can see that there's at least three different species of fish there, and so we say collectively that these are fishes. So in Hawaii, we do have lots of different species of fishes, around 1,200 overall. Most of these are going to be in marine waters. About 400 species are what we call nearshore fishes. That is, they include things that are intertidal or are on coral reefs and habitats like that. Now the anatomy of fishes, of course, is a lot different than the anatomy of most warm-blooded vertebrates. Uh, that is, they don't have any fur like cats or dogs would, and they have an integument that is enclosed by scales, and the scales have a protective function. And of course, fish also have fins. We have a dorsal fin, sometimes two dorsal fins. We have pectoral fins and pelvic fins, and also a caudal fin. In most species, the caudal fin or tail fin generates the most force that's used to propel the fish forward. The pectoral fins are also used to some extent to help maintain the correct orientation and pitch and yaw of the fish. Now the fins are not only important for locomotion of the fish, but they're also important for identification. So if you're ever tasked with identifying a fish that you've caught, chances are you're going to need to count the number of spinous rays in the dorsal fin and also the number of filamentous rays. The spinous rays are the ones that are pokey, sort of like a syringe needle, and the filamentous rays are the ones that are soft. Now if we look forward on the fish, we can see that there's a gill cover called an operculum. The operculum is important because this is how we're going to monitor respiration rate uh, if we have a fish that's under anesthesia or in surgery. And so the operculum's job is to move water over the gills as the fish breathes. And now the gills themselves are used for respiration, but also to some extent they're used for excretion. And of course, look at the eye. Uh, eyes of fishes can be very large, they can be very small. This is a particular fish that's found uh, mainly at night. It usually hangs out uh, under the reef during the day, but it is a nocturnal fish, and so it has very large eyes. The other thing you'll notice is that it has a very conspicuous lateral line. The lateral line is special to fishes, and it's a type of sensory organ that can detect vibrations uh, and movements of other fish uh, in the area. And so even if a fish can't see you and you, let's say, stick your arm into a bucket full of fish, it will know you're there because it has this ability to detect vibrations and movements of things in the water column. Okay, finally, we'll end up here talking about the anus and your genital papore. They're located just anterior to the anal fin. And so uh, both poop and pee are going to come out here. Also, we're going to have the shedding of eggs or sperm, whether it's a male or a female, coming out of the your genital papore. In some species, we can actually identify whether you're male or female based on the shape of something called the urogenital papillae, which is just a bump extending from the urogenital pore. Now later in the laboratory class, we're going to do a fish dissection, and if you've never dissected the fish before, uh, the anatomy is a little bit different than what we're going to see inside of a mammal. Uh, we do have a very well-developed uh, digestive system. You'll see a stomach and an intestine. Uh, you'll also see the mesonephric kidney, which is located dorsally uh, in the body cavity. Probably the largest thing in the body cavity after the digestive system will be the gonads. If we have a sexually mature fish, the gonads can be quite large and extend uh, almost up to the gill opening. Now the heart of the fish is located uh, ventral to the gills in something called the isthmus. And the heart here is not four chambers, that is two atria and two ventricles, but it's actually three chambers, one ventricle, one bulbous arteriosus, and one sinus venosus. And so blood is propelled in a single direction. And this is good enough for a fish because they're cold-blooded, but this type of heart, of course, would not be adequate for something that is warm-blooded and has to have a lot of circulation. Now the brain is located dorsally and adjacent to the brain is an area where the otoliths are located. We're going to talk about otoliths later on in the lecture because they are used for aging. Okay, now on to some of the laboratory procedures that we use in fisheries science. Now, a note about lab procedures. Uh, unlike what we do in the veterinary clinic where you're trying to treat a patient and, of course, keep them alive, a scientist is trying to get as much information as possible from that fish. 
And for that reason, many of the procedures that we do are going to be terminal procedures. That is, we're usually going to have to go into the body cavity, collect some gonads, collect the otolus, and these procedures usually tend to be terminal. And so just be prepared that if you go into fisheries biology, chances are you'll be euthanizing a fair number of fish. So first of all, we'll talk about some of the procedures that are used both in the veterinary clinic, but also by fish biologists. And the first of these procedures is anesthesia. Sometimes we're going to need to sedate or anesthetize the fish for a certain type of procedure. Now, we're going to go through several different types of anesthetics, but the most common anesthetic and the only one that's approved by the AVMA is something called tricane fin quill, or MS-222. So MS-222 is produced by a company called Argent, and this is not a controlled drug, um, but it is sprinkled in the water, uh, let's say if you have a closed container with a fish in it, to sedate or even anesthetize the fish. Now, be warned that if you're doing aquaculture that this drug has a 21-day withdrawal time, and that means that you cannot uh, release that fish or sacrifice that fish and then take it to market uh, within 21 days of the anesthesia date. So the dosage for MS-222 varies widely among species and even between individuals. We're usually trying to get somewhere between 50 and 150 milligrams per liter of water because most anesthetics used on fishes are used by immersing that fish uh, in a solution containing both the anesthetic and some regular water. Now, if we're using MS-222 in fresh water, we have to be careful to buffer that with sodium bicarbonate because Finquil is a little bit acidic. And so by adding the sodium bicarbonate, we buffer that and get that up to a neutral pH. Now, with any of these anesthetic agents, if we want to reverse anesthesia, we simply remove the fish from the anesthetic solution, place it back into fresh water, and make sure that it's adequately aerated. So another anesthetic that's sometimes used in fisheries biology and fish research is something called quinaldine sulfate. Quinaldine sulfate uh, dissolves readily in water, and it's used commonly by ornamental fish traders, uh, sometimes even to collect fish. In this case, it's important to realize that in order to use any type of anesthetic in the water to collect a fish, you need a state permit, and basically they tend not to grant those anymore. And so fish traders still use this on occasion to sedate a fish during transport or things like that, but this isn't a very common anesthetic in aquaculture because it's not approved for use in food fishes, and it's also not used very commonly in the veterinary clinic. Now the dosage of quinaldine sulfate, just like MS-222, varies widely among species, but it's usually somewhere around 10 to 60 milligrams per liter of water. Now another type of anesthetic we can use that you may not find in your textbook is clove oil. Now clove oil is something that we can find at the drugstore, and traditionally it's used on people's gums, uh, children that are teething and things like that. But clove oil is actually a very good anesthetic for fish, but it needs to be dissolved in 95% alcohol. And that's because it's a lipid, it doesn't dissolve readily in water. So get yourself uh, about one mil of clove oil and around 10 mils of 95% ethanol. Mix that up really well until it's dissolved and then you can just add a few drops of that solution to a small container of water containing the fish that you want to anesthetize. And basically there's no set dosage here but you want to titrate those number of drops until you see uh, either sedation or anesthesia. Now you should note that clove oil is not approved by the AVMA. Uh, I don't know why the AVMA is so dead set against clove oil. Uh, it tends to work pretty well. Sometimes it has less side effects than MS-222. In addition, it's also pretty safe to work with. So in case you're interested, here are some dosages for some common drugs used in the anesthesia and sedation of fish. I've highlighted the three that we've talked about this far, that is MS-222, quinaldine, and clove oil. And what you should see here is that the dosages vary quite widely between species. Uh, things like the carp require a lot of MS-222, where something like the salmon doesn't require so much. For all these drugs, you're going to start out with about half the amount that is suggested. Uh, put that in the water, wait for a minute, and see what happens. If you see no signs of anesthesia, then you're going to add a little bit more and a little bit more, and so on. And so in that respect, it's kind of like propofol. Now, if you'd like to read more about the use of anesthetic agents in aquaculture and fisheries biology, click at the link below. So we can classify the stages of anesthesia into different planes, just like what we do with mammals. For example, stage one of anesthesia here is called sedation, and we can verify that a fish is sedated by monitoring its breathing, that is, looking at the movements of the gill flaps or operculum. So when it's sedated, the gill flaps should be moving a little bit slower than the, what they were before. 
in stage three, which is surgical anesthesia, we should see a loss of equilibrium. That is, that fish is going to roll over on its side or even go upside down. And that indicates the fish is pretty deep. And we should also be able to do um, various types of reflexes, touching the cornea, things like that. If they don't react, then it's a pretty good indication that they're at a surgical plane of anesthesia. Now, a note about touching and handling fish. They do have a very nice protective mucus coating. And the more we handle that fish, the more likely we are to rub that off. And so we want to tend to minimize the handling of the fish, always make sure that it's touching something that's soft and wet and not touching anything that's going to rip off scales or rip off mucus. And of course, we want to avoid stage four, which is an anesthetic overdose. Uh, stage four, you can notice because breathing rate will completely stop. The opercula will stop moving. Uh, and if you put on that Doppler monitor, you'll see that the heart rate is really, really slow and eventually going to stop. But of course, if we're euthanizing the fish, we do want to use an overdose and get that fish until its heart stops. And we can verify that, again, using the Doppler probe or by doing a blood draw and exsanguinating that fish. So this picture on the left-hand side shows a fish that's at a surgical plane of anesthesia. You'll notice that it's on its side or sometimes might be upside down. You might still see a little bit of fin movement, but you should notice a regular uh, movement of the opercula of the gills indicating that it's still breathing. Now, if it's a short surgical procedure, you can simply pull that fish out of water, put it on a wet sponge or wet paper towel, uh, do your procedure, and just occasionally put some fresh water on those gills. However, if it's going to be a long procedure taking more than a couple of minutes, you're probably going to use a more detailed surgical setup, which is shown at right. You can see that they have two tanks, tank A, tank B. Tank B consists of a pump, which is pumping the anesthetic water through a loop that's going into the fish's gills and then back out again. And when it gets back into that tank, it's getting adequately aerated to ensure that we're both delivering anesthesia and also oxygen to that fish. Now, once that fish is set to recover from anesthesia, we can move that air stone and the pump on over to tank A, which contains fresh water uh, with no anesthetic agent, and that fish should eventually revive. So you might be asking yourself, how do we monitor a fish during anesthesia? Well, as I said before, the one thing that you can use is the movements of the opercula or gill flaps, because that indicates the respiratory rate. Now, the respiratory rate of fishes varies widely, so I'm not going to give any ranges, but you should monitor the respiration rate before anesthesia to get a baseline, and then during anesthesia, you should make sure that it doesn't go down too far. And so we can monitor the respiration rate. The other thing that we can monitor is the heart rate. The heart rate can be assessed actually quite easily by placing a Doppler probe underneath the gill isthmus, which is the very uh, end part of the gills. And right under that is where the heart is located. And the heart is located very uh, close to the ventral surface of the animal. So just placing that probe and a little bit of, of that gel on that probe, you should be able to get a heart rate fairly easily. Now, if you'd like to see an example of a fish surgery, click at the link below. Now, sometimes we may also want to mark the fish. And marking is something that's done both in fisheries research and also for use of fishes as laboratory animals. Several different types of tags we can use. Probably the most common tag and least expensive one is something called a Floyd tag. A Floyd tag is basically a little string tag that is attached uh, using a marking gun. And this marking gun uh, is basically the same gun that we use to put price tags on merchandise like clothing uh, in the clothing industry. And so we simply insert this needle uh, just underneath the dorsal fin or the adipose fin. And we squeeze the handle. And it puts a T-bar like structure through the fish. And coming out of the fish will be this tag. Now the tag on there should list the information, um, for example, a phone number for somebody that can be contacted uh, if somebody catches this fish. It will also list the fish's unique identification number. And so we tend to use these a lot in mark and recapture studies. That is where we catch a fish, we measure it, we put the tag in, and then we put it back in the water. Now later on, fishermen might catch that, or we might recatch that. And we can use the time between the two captures and also the growth of that fish during that time to estimate the growth rate. We can also use the proportion of fish that are tagged versus untagged uh, in the recaptures to estimate the population abundance. Another tag that you're probably familiar with are the pit tags or microchip tags. So these are similar, or in some cases, the same tags that we use to place in cats and dogs.
and so pit tags can be injected into the peritoneum or they can be injected just between the pelvic fins. Now pit tags, as you know, uh, require that you have a transponder uh, to scan that fish and so a lot of times we use pit tags in laboratory research or sometimes we'll use them in hatcheries uh, where we're producing a lot of fishes that we're releasing in the wild and as those fishes are released they go past a transponder and it gives us an idea of how many fish are entering the environment. Now one drawback to pit tags, of course, is they're quite expensive. If properly placed, pit tags are also not visible externally. So if you're doing a study that requires external visualization of the tag, you want to stick with something like the Floyd tag or one of the disc tags. Another type of tag is something called an elastomer tag. An elastomer tag is basically just an injectable latex tag. And so we tend to use this on species that are too small to either use Floyd tags or pit tags in. For example, if you look at the shrimp at the top left-hand side of the screen, you can see that the scientist is injecting a little bit of latex uh, just underneath uh, the rostrum there. And so there's several different colors of this latex compound available, and so we can do multiple injections to give each fish an individual uh, identifier. Now, marking with elastomer is very time consuming. It's also somewhat costly. The compound's very expensive, uh, and it induces a fair amount of stress on the fish. So, we tend to only use it on small species that cannot be marked very efficiently with other techniques. Now another type of tag is something called an acoustic tag. Uh, this is where we place an acoustic transmitter inside the fish or attach it to the outside of the fish. And we tend to do this only for larger species of fish and we tend to do it for one reason. We want to find out the movements of that fish. And so if we're placing an acoustic tag, we're either going to have to follow that fish once it's released, let's say with a kayak with a hydrophone mounted on it, or we can place acoustic receivers in the field that will monitor when the fish passes by that receiver. And so we tend to use this for large fish such as a lua or sharks or things like that that swim very, very large distances. But this requires that you have an adequate amount of these acoustic receivers and that you deploy them and occasionally retrieve them to download the movement data. Now the last method we can use to mark a fish is something called chemical marking. And chemical marking is traditionally going to be used on very small fish, uh, usually fry or larvae. And we tend to immerse these individuals in a bath of a chemical compound. Uh, usually that chemical is oxytetracycline. Now we're not using it here as an antibiotic, but because tetracycline will leave an indelible mark on the developing bone, including the otoliths. And the otoliths are just ear bones of fishes. And it, you can take a look at the picture at right and see this fluorescent mark that's left on the otolith. And so obviously in order to verify the mark we're eventually going to have to sacrifice that fish but we tend to use chemical marking in situations where we're looking at a large number of fishes uh, and releasing them into the environment and then recapturing them at some point and we want to find out how many have the mark and how many don't have the mark uh, maybe to do a population analysis or something like that. And so chemical marking does eventually require the sacrifice of the fish in order to validate that that fish does indeed have the mark. Okay, radiography is another technique that's used commonly in the veterinary clinic, maybe not so commonly on fishes, but it can be done. And so basically, we usually need to anesthetize our fish, uh, get it to probably the surgical plane of anesthesia, and then take that fish out of water, uh, place it on a piece of plastic overlying the cassette, uh, and then we're going to take our x-rays just as we normally would for any cat or dog. So usually the settings you're going to use here are going to be without a grid. Uh, traditionally, you're using a setting that's similar to a carpus uh, or a tarsus. Uh, of a cat or a dog. Now during this process, even though the fish might be sedated or even at a surgical plane of anesthesia, it's a good idea to wrap that fish in a wet paper towel. Uh, that will keep it semi-restrained uh, during the procedure so it doesn't flop off the cassette and end up on the floor. So the radiograph at right is just a radiograph from the same three fish that we saw in the past slide. Now what you can notice is that some of these fishes have very dark uh, radiolucent marks in there and the fish down at the bottom doesn't have any of those marks. And so what we're seeing here is actually the gas bladder. The gas bladder is an organ that fish use to maintain uh, neutral buoyancy within the water column. And so fish that swim upright on the reef tend to have gas bladders, whereas fish that are bottom feeders or stuck to the bottom like the ictalurid catfish below don't have gas bladders. The other thing you might notice is a very white radio-opaque mark uh, around the region of the brain. And these are the otoliths. Otoliths are ear bones that are used for uh, orientation and balance in the fish. And these are also the bones that we may use in fishery science to get an estimate of the age of the fish.
Now, although we can use traditional radiography to x-ray a fish in the veterinary clinic, uh, most scientific studies that involve x-rays uh, do not use screen films. That is, we tend to use a non-screen film that requires a very long exposure time on the order of several minutes. And for this reason, the fish usually needs to be euthanized for this because obviously it can't be moving around. Now you might be asking yourself, why would a scientist want to x-ray the fish? And the reason is that we can learn a lot about the evolution of a fish or its taxonomic status, that is, how it's related to other species, by looking at its osteology. The osteology is just the study of the bones, the fin rays, and other hard elements that are in the fish. And so at the bottom of the screen, you, you can see an example of a very good non-screen film that's been taken of a euthanized fish. And not only can you see the vertebrae, you can see the dorsal spines, uh, the dorsal rays. You can see very detailed anatomy. And that's because the emulsion on these non-screen films is very, very fine. But it also requires a very long exposure time. And for that reason, the fish usually needs to be euthanized. Now, blood collection is a technique we commonly do in the veterinary clinic in order to assess the health status of our patient, and we can do blood collection on fishes. Uh, traditionally, if you're treating a fish in the veterinary clinic, you want to do a blood draw. The tail vein is going to be uh, the best vein to use. And so basically, you go in at an oblique angle uh, with a small syringe uh, between the anal fin and the caudal fin, and you fish around until uh, you hit the spine, and right around there, just underneath the spine, should be a very large vein that you can draw blood from. It's important to realize, however, that if we're doing a scientific study, let's say we're looking at hormones or something like that, uh, usually we're going to try to get as much blood as possible. And fish have very small blood volumes. Uh, it's on the order of somewhere between 30 to 70 milligrams per kilogram. And this is down at the order of what cats are, but because this fish is much smaller than a cat, we're probably going to have to exsanguinate that fish, that is, withdraw all the blood that we can get in order to do something like a hormone assay. Now, the other thing you should know about fish, if you're looking at blood, is that fish have nucleated red blood cells. Can you think of other species that have nucleated red blood cells? Now, another type of diagnostic procedure we can perform in the veterinary clinic is a skin scrape. A uh, skin scrape is just where we take a scalpel blade or a slide and scrape off some of that external mucus on the fish. And what we're trying to evaluate here is the presence of external parasites. As you've learned in a previous lecture that parasites are probably the number two problem with the health of fish, with water quality being number one. And so we can have parasites uh, on the outside, we can have parasites on the gills, and we can also have parasites on the inside. So to do a skin scrape, simply take a slide, run it down the side of that fish, uh, squash that out a little bit, and then add whatever stain you need to be able to visualize those parasites and observe it under the microscope. Now, if you do detect parasites, there are several different treatments for fish. Uh, you can use things like formaldehyde in very small quantities. You can also use copper sulfate, things like that. For marine fishes, if we are bringing them in and keeping them in aquaria, uh, one of the safest and easiest things we can do is to very quickly give that fish what we call a freshwater dip. Uh, basically, you take the marine fish, uh, take it out of salt water, and drop it in a bucket of fresh water for probably a minute, maybe no more than two minutes. Now, the fish is not going to like that. It's going to become very agitated. But because the fish has a kidney and can osmoregulate to some extent, uh, it usually survives the process. The invertebrates that are on the gills and on the skin surface oftentimes do not endure the process because they don't have the same ability to osmoregulate. So those saltwater parasites will basically swell up and burst because they've been immersed in fresh water. So another procedure we can do to evaluate the health of the fish is do a gill filament biopsy. Now remember the gills uh, are an organ that has two purposes. It's used for respiration, but it's also used to excrete metabolic byproducts to some extent. And so we want to make sure that the gill filaments are nice and healthy. Uh, the gill filaments usually should have a very well-defined uh, simple epithelia on there and not a lot of mucus on there. So we can even take a live fish that's properly anesthetized, uh, take a pair of iris scissors, and just clip off uh, one of the edges of those gill filaments, uh, look at it under the microscope with a cover slip, and do not squash it. And we should see very well-defined primary filaments, or primary lamellae, and secondary lamellae. Uh, so that's what you're seeing in the picture at the bottom right.
Now on the other hand, if you look at the gills and they have lots of blotches on there or excessive amounts of mucus or even cysts of different types of invertebrate parasites, it indicates that fish is not doing well. Uh, probably you notice this in the first place that the fish is breathing more frequently and if it has gill parasites, uh, we oftentimes see things uh, on the external uh, part of the gill cover as well. And so if you have a fish that has gill parasites, uh, you can treat it uh, using, again, copper sulfate or any one of the various compounds. Okay, so now we're going to shift gear and talk about some techniques that are used exclusively in fishery science. Now you might be saying, well, hey, I'm going to be a veterinary technician. What do I need to know about fishery science? Well, technically fishery science does fit in with lab animal medicine because fishery species are studied through a lab animal approach. Now, the other thing that you should know is that Hawaii is a place where we have a lot of fish and a lot of very important fish stocks. So even though you may start out as a veterinary technician who might want to work uh, with cats and dogs, there is the opportunity to work at places like Coconut Island, uh, HIMB, uh, or work at Oceanic Institute or for the state of Hawaii because there's a lot of need to study the biology of fish species that are taken both recreationally and also on a commercial basis. And so the primary goal of fishery science is to collect and use biological data uh, from our fish populations to create and implement management strategies that's going to allow us to sustainably harvest fish stocks, that is harvest them without over harvesting. So here's a list of laboratory procedures that we do on fishery species. We want to find out the relationship between length and weight. Uh, we want to find out how old they get using otoliths. Uh, we're going to look at the gonads to find out uh, whether they're immature or mature, whether they're spawning or they're not spawning. And we also want to look at the gonads to find out how many eggs they produce. And this is called fecundity. And finally, in order to really institute uh, very good fisheries management strategies, we need to know some things about the population structure. That is, how many fish are there? Uh, what is their size structure? Are there more big fish than little fish? What is their sex ratio? And finally, what is their mortality rate? So of course the first step in doing any kind of fisheries management is to collect that life history data. So we need to go out and collect some fishes. Now there's several different ways we can collect fish. We can do hook and line, we can use nets, and here you can see we're actually using a spear. So it just depends on the species you're looking at and what option is logistically easiest. Now depending on where your fish of interest are located, you may just be able to snorkel and spearfish those guys or catch them from a boat. Uh, sometimes if we're working with deeper fish that don't readily bite hook and line, uh, we're going to need to do some scuba diving or something like that. And depending on how deep you're going, you're going to need to take either a little of equipment or a lot of equipment. And so here you can see a diver that is on a rebreather, which is sort of an advanced type of dive gear that enables them to go quite a bit deeper and stay quite a bit longer. Another advantage of this type of technology is it doesn't produce any bubbles. And bubbles, for some reason, uh, tend to scare fish. And so you can get a lot closer to a fish if you're not breathing out bubbles. But on the other hand, if you're carrying all this crap around, it's a lot harder to move around. So your ability to uh, move between area to area is pretty limited. So usually in a dive, we're moving maybe 100 meters. Now, if everything has gone according to plan, hopefully you arrive back uh, on the boat and to the laboratory with several individuals of the species that you're interested in looking at. And so here you can see the mini, which is the convict tang or convict surgeon fish, which is a very common fish here in Hawaii. And so the first thing we want to do is get those fish on ice, and then we want to collect our length and weight data. The weight, we just slap that fish up on a scale and weigh it. We can collect the length data using a simple ruler, and the lengths we traditionally collect are the fork length, the total length, and also the standard length. The total length is simply the length from the snout to the very tips of the tail, whereas the fork length is the distance from the snout to the fork. Now some fish like tuna have very deep forks, and some fish don't have forks at all. And finally the last length that's collected for mo almost all fishes is the standard length. The standard length is the length from the tip of the snout to the caudal flexure. That is, grab the tail fin, bend it backwards, and the area where it bends is the area that you're going to measure the standard length to. So after we've collected our length weight data, we're then going to dissect the fish to remove its gonads and also the otoliths. The gonads are going to be used for uh, estimating the maturity and also spawning seasonality of that fish, and the otoliths are those ear bones that we pull out of the head and use to estimate the age of the fish.
Now, a lot of times we tend to do this work ourselves, but in some areas we can actually train people, uh, even local fishermen, to help catch the fish and even to process the fish for us. And so it tends to be much more successful if you involve the local fishing community because they tend to be much more aware of your efforts and much more responsive to any type of fisheries management strategies that you suggest. So you're probably going to be dissecting a fish during the laboratory portion of this course. And when you do, don't just take a look at the gonads and the otoliths, but also look at the outside of the body. In particular, take a look at the teeth, because the teeth give you a real good idea about what this fish eats. If you take a look at the teeth of the manini here, you can see that it has little comb-shaped teeth. And these teeth are used to graze off the filamentous algae that grows on reefs. And so these are herbivorous fishes. And once you cut them open, you can see that the entire body cavity is basically filled with intestines full of this green gunk. And the reason they have such large intestines is that plant matter, for the most part, is pretty low in nutrients. And so they need a very long digestive tract to absorb it. The other thing you'll notice about herbivorous fishes is that they're kind of like cows. They don't eat at a particular time of the day, they eat all day long. And again, that's because their food is pretty nutrient poor, and so they need to keep eating, 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 eating during all daylight hours. The other thing you might notice about your dissection of the fish is that you probably see that it has very large, um, well, gonads, uh, either ovaries or testes. And that's only if the fish is sexually mature. If it's immature, it's going to be very hard to find the gonads. But in a mature fish, we see that they have very large gonads. Uh, and so unlike, uh, let's say, mammals, which may ovulate one or two, or if you're a pig, 14 oocytes at one time, a lot of fish will ovulate thousands or sometimes even hundreds of thousands of oocytes at a given time. And the reason for this is that most fishes have external fertilization. That is, the eggs and the sperm are shed into the water column, and there's no parental care. As a result of this, the survivorship of the offspring tends to be quite low. And because it's quite low, uh, fish have sort of evolved to hedge their bets, just produce lots and lots of eggs and sperm, and hopefully one or two of those eggs will uh, fertilize and will make it all the way through embryonic development and settle out and become an adult. And so this is a very different life history strategy uh, that we have in fishes than what we have in cats and dogs, where they produce mm, relatively few offspring. Now, while I'm on the subject of fish gonads, I should say something about the reproductive biology of fishes. There's basically three different spawning modes that fish can use. Uh, some of them are demersal spawners that lay their eggs on the bottom. For example, think about finding Nemo. Uh, many of them are pelagic spawners. That is, the males and females shed the eggs uh, and the sperm into the water column. Uh, the sperm fertilize the eggs, and the eggs drift off to become part of the plankton. And this is probably the most common type of spawning mode that we see in coral reef fishes. And so here at the right-hand side of the screen, you can see an example of a spawning aggregation. The female fish are releasing their eggs at the same time the male is releasing their sperm. And that's what you see is just a big cloud of sperm and eggs. Kind of gross, right? Uh, good thing humans aren't this way. It would make mm, sex a lot stickier. As I said in the previous slide, pelagic spawners uh, tend to have very low survivorship of the eggs because they're not protected. Uh, we don't do any type of parental care. And a lot of these are going to get eaten by other fishes before they have a chance to metamorphose and settle out onto the reef. And that's why fish produce so many eggs and so much sperm. Now, another strategy that we see in some fishes is mouth brooding. That is, the females will lay the eggs, and then either the male or the female will scoop up the eggs once they've been fertilized and keep the eggs in their mouth. We tend to see this in things like cichlids, for example, tilapia. And this is very good because it increases the survivorship of the offspring dramatically. And this also makes mouth brooding fish a very good candidates for aquaculture because it's much more likely we're going to get their fry or larvae uh, through the stages necessary to grow them up to adults. It's much harder to culture a coral reef fish that has pelagic eggs and larvae. It's virtually impossible for some species. And so the fish species that have been very successful in aquaculture, most of them are either demersal spawners or mouth brooders, for example, the tilapia. Now, another weird fact about fish reproductive biology is that some fish can change sex. That is, they can change from male to female, called protandry, or female to male, called protogyny. And so both protandry and protogyny are forms of what we call sequential hermaphroditism, or sex change. Now, other fish might be simultaneous hermaphrodites. This is quite a bit more rare. This is where individuals can function both as males and females at the same time. That is, they have mature ova and also mature sperm in the same gonad. 
And finally, there are a lot of fish, the majority of the fish on the coral reefs that are just like cats and dogs. That is, they're gonochoristic. The sexes are separate. You're either male or you're female, and you can't change. And so if you're working on a particular species of fish, it's important to learn whether it's gonochoristic or some type of hermaphrodite, because that's going to drastically influence your management strategies. Okay, so we're back in the laboratory, or if you're a fish biologist, you're in whatever passes for a laboratory. We've dissected the gonads out of our fishes. The next thing we're going to do is weigh them, and then we're going to preserve them in something like formaldehyde. Now, the reason that we weigh the gonads is because we can use the proportion of gonad weight to fish weight uh, to get an estimate of reproductive effort. Uh, during a spawning season, fish tend to have much larger gonads in proportion to their body size than they do uh, when the end of the spawning season draws near. And so we can use the change in gonad weight relative to body weight to estimate the seasonality of reproduction in fishes. So after we've preserved the gonads, the next step is going to be to do a histological analysis of those gonadal tissues. And we do this using something called histological microtechnique. Now remember, histology is the study of tissues, and microtechnique is the process that we use to prepare those tissues for histological analysis. So what you can see here is uh, the woman up front is using something called a microtome, which is basically a machine that has a very sharp knife on it, and we use it to cut very thin sections out of the gonads, and then we place those tissues on the microscope slides. So after we go through all of our micro technique and we stain our slides, we're going to get some histological sections that maybe look like this. And so on the left hand side of the screen you can see a section from a male, that is it's a testis, and we can tell that it's a mature testis because it has a lot of spermatozoa that are present within the testis. Now on the right hand side we have ovaries of females. On the top part we can see the ovary of an immature female. You can see that the eggs or oocytes here are very small. They tend to have a very dark staining cytoplasm and a prominently large nucleus. Now if we go down below, we can see that the eggs here in a mature female are a lot larger. The ooplasm here is proportionally much larger than the nucleus. And also we can see several granules. Those granules are vitilin, and vitilin is a protein that's produced in sexually mature or maturing females. So that's yolk protein. So anytime we see a specimen that has vitiligenic oocytes, we know that that female is mature. Now, if we're studying a hermaphroditic or sequentially hermaphroditic fish, we may in fact find both testicular tissue and ovarian tissue in the same gonad. So this is a section through the ovotestis of a fish that is protandrous. That is, it starts out as male and changes to female. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see there's a little bit of testicular tissue still there. We can actually still see some sperm, so they might be able to function as a male at this point. But on the right-hand side of the screen, we can also see a developing ovary. You can see the very small, dark staining oocytes that are immature, and then you see a larger one that's beginning to mature. And so we don't see any of those vitilin granules here, so we can't say that this fish could function as both male and female, but by looking at this gonad, we could say it's shifting from male to female. So this again is an example of a protandrous hermaphrodite. Okay, so once we process the gonads for a lot of individuals in the population, we're going to try to plot the L50, or size of maturity. So the L50 is the size at which 50% of the individuals of a given sex are sexually mature, and it tends to be different for males and females. So as you can see here, males of this particular species tend to mature around 90 millimeters of total length, whereas females tend to mature around 164 millimeters. And this is quite common in coral reef fishes. Typically males will mature sooner and also grow larger, whereas females will mature later and then once they do mature, oftentimes their growth may slow quite a bit because of the energetic investment that females put into reproduction. Another type of information we might want to collect from the gonads is the fecundity. Now fecundity is basically the number of oocytes that are ovulated in a single spawning event. And again, for something like a cat or a dog, we're talking about less than a dozen, uh, whereas in something like a fish, it can be thousands of oocytes at a single spawning event. In fact, most fish in Hawaii tend to ovulate several times a year, and so they're what we call batch spawners. And so in order to find out the number of eggs that are ovulated in a single event, we have to meticulously go through an ovary or a portion of the ovary and pull out the eggs that are ready to be spawned. Now once we do that, we can get a graph like we see here on the right hand side of the screen that plots the number of eggs versus the length of that fish. And what we normally see is that the larger the fish we have, the more eggs it will produce.
For example, if we look at a fish that has just recently matured, let's say around 16 centimeters in this case, uh, it may produce as few as 30,000 eggs. Now that seems like a lot, but let's take a look now at what a larger fish will produce. So in the case of Manini, a fish that is only 6 centimeters larger than our last fish will produce 300,000 eggs per spawn. That's 10 times more than what that smaller fish would produce. And so this is a relationship that we typically see in fishery science. Larger fish produce more eggs. And this is obviously important for resource management. Uh, sometimes we actually want to protect the larger females because they contribute a larger proportion of the offspring to the future population. So in order to properly manage a coral reef fishery, in addition to knowing the size and maturity of the fish and how many eggs it's going to produce, we also want to know how old it gets and at what age it sexually matures. And in order to find out information about age, we usually need to do age growth analysis. So this involves uh, dissecting the fish and pulling out small stones called otoliths, which are found uh, in the inner ear of the fish. Now we extract these otoliths, we embed them into a resin, we cut them up uh, into sections and we pull out those sections and we polish them with sandpaper and also polishing compound until they're very, very smooth. Now once we do that, we can look at these sectioned otoliths underneath a microscope and begin to count the rings. So as it turns out, the otoliths of fishes uh, lay down rings at regular intervals, similar to what a tree does. You've probably seen a section tree trunk and you can count the rings there. Well, in the same manner, we can count the rings on fish otoliths to estimate the age. And so here you can see an example of a fish otolith under regular light microscopy. And the white arrows indicate what we think are annual bands. That is, these are dark areas that are created on the otolith uh, once a year. And so we can look at this and estimate that the age of this fish has got to be at least seven or eight years old. Now in tropical areas like Hawaii, uh, many of the fishes may not lay down annual rings, but they may lay down daily rings. So this picture here shows an example of daily rings on the otolith of a cardinal fish. And you can see that the rings are very fine, brown structures there, and you can count the number of rings, get the age for that fish, but it's important to document and find out whether or not these rings are created daily or weekly or whatever. And in order to do that, we will go out and catch some fish, keep them alive, and then inject them with a chemical compound that will mark those otoliths, similar to maybe oxytetracycline, or we can use something called alizarin complexone. And so once that fish has been marked with a chemical compound, we then put it in an aquaria or put it in a pen and let it live for another 30, 40, 50 days. And then at a certain interval, we go out and kill one of those fishes, uh, euthanize it, and then look at its otoliths. And so here is an example of a fish that was marked uh, with a chemical compound 30 days prior to sacrifice. And the yellow arrow shows the chemical mark that's left on the otolith. And what you should notice here is that you probably see somewhere between 28 to 32 uh, rings after that chemical mark, which does indeed suggest that this fish probably is laying down daily rings. So after we examine the otoliths of several fish in the population and count all the rings, we'll be able to plot something called a growth curve, uh, usually a von Bertalanthe growth curve. Don't need to remember the name, but just know that we're looking at the relationship between age, which is on the x-axis, and size, or length, which is on the y-axis. And once we have that information, we can then superimpose the size at maturity with the age growth curve. For example, the blue circle indicates the probable size at maturity of males, which is around 90 millimeters, that we now see is around 200 days whereas females that mature at around 16 centimeters or 160 millimeters, we see that their age at maturity is somewhere around 400 days. And so this brings up a very important point. Most fish have what we call indeterminate growth. That means they tend to keep growing throughout life. Even though that growth might slow, they're still growing. And so if we see a larger fish, we know that that is also going to be an older fish, with a few exceptions. Now what we found out from doing these type of age growth analyses is that the age and longevity of reef fishes really varies widely between taxonomic groups. For example, really small bodied fishes like gobies and triple fins tend to live very short lifespans. Uh, for example, Schindleria is a goby that really only lives 40 to 50 days, uh, so not very long at all. On the other hand, if we look at the kala, which is a unicorn fish uh, we see commonly here in Hawaii, it may live over 40, 50, maybe even 60 years. And so the age of reef fishes really varies quite widely. 
And this really has some pretty important management implications. Uh, if we have a fish that lives a long time and matures at a very old age, they tend to be more prone to overfishing than fish that have shorter lifespans and mature at an earlier age. Okay, so, so far I've talked about the life history information that we need in order to evaluate a population for fisheries management. We said we needed the length frequency data, we need information on its age and growth, we need information on the size and age at maturity, and now finally we need some demographic information. That is information on the population as a whole. We need to know how many individuals are out there, uh, what their relative abundances are, uh, their sex ratios, and there's two different ways to do this. Uh, one thing we can do is just go out and do some more fishing. As long as that fishing uh, is pretty non-selective, we can get a good, accurate estimation of the relative length frequency and therefore age frequency of the population. Another way we can do this is using something called laser videogrammetry. Basically, we go out and swim through the water and we videotape those fish while we're projecting these two laser dots onto them. And because the lasers are a known distance apart, in this case three centimeters, we can use the images that we retrieve from the video footage to estimate the fish size. Now remember what I said in the last slide, uh, fish size and fish age are pretty well correlated for a lot of species. And so if we know the size of the fish and we already have growth data for that species, we can back calculate the age of the fish. And that information can be used to get at things like mortality. So if you want to see an example of laser videogrammetry that's mm, kind of humorous, uh, click on the link below.